Nature is the antidote to humanity's wounds. I can't think about human health without thinking about planetary health because the two are intrinsically linked. We have, as a technological food system, engineered a moment where humanity would completely forget itself. Every chemical we put into our environment tends to further deepen the wound. Roundup glyphosate cuts the relationship between soil and its life within it, as well as the protein structures within our gut. We never needed these chemicals until we broke the rules of biology. There is an easy way to step back into right relationship with nature. If you take ancient soil systems not touched by human hands and add that back to human cells, immediately we were getting results at the science level that we could not have imagined. The exciting thing about knowing that is that we can change direction. We have the opportunity to birth a new humanity, a new biology, a new expression. May we honor all of the potential of humanity within ourselves and within those that we see around ourselves so that we can become the thing that we know is possible. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast where every single week we get the honor and privilege to sit down with an incredible mind to learn more about the true nature of self and the world around us at deeper levels every single week. Today we have a returning champion who <laughs> formerly is known for his expertise in internal medicine, endocrinology, and hospice care, and he's really a thought leader on the microbiome as it pertains to health, disease, and food systems. I've gotten to know him deeper as a friend who loves to play piano and guitar and dance. And something I really cherish about this individual is he's got a beautiful humility about him that I really cherish and openness that, uh, you know, anything that he experiences in any given moment can really change him. And that openness is something that I really value. And I'm excited to dive deeper into that as well in this conversation today. He's a powerful articulator and synthesizer of the inner dimension of how we've really become disconnected and the reasons for disease individually and on the planet at large. And on the same token, our innate capacity to awaken to a new paradigm completely. And one where we, we awaken to um, our ability to heal, to, to realize the love of self that we have for others, for ourselves, for the planet and uh, humanity at large, and ultimately to become empowered as beacons of light for our communities. So Zach Bush, welcome back to the show. <laughs> Wonderful to be with you, Andre. It's just awesome to share the space and time. And thank you everybody for giving me the time in your life. And as you listen to this podcast, it's a joy to be with all of you. Our conversations always feel like a, a ceremony in, mm. in, the, in and of themselves. <laughs> and we got a lot of that reflection from our last conversation in our in our old studio. So, so welcome back. I'm excited to dive deeper into so much uh, from the micro to the macro of this process of healing, of awakening. Uh, and let's start just, I would love for you to give a little bit of context of what some of the new science mm -hmm. that's coming out of your cell biology lab. Um, and we can go from there. Awesome. Yeah, I'll give you a little context of the lab itself. Um, my background, as you mentioned on the clinical side was internal medicine, which is basically hospital-based care, a lot of ICU stuff. Then endocrinology and metabolism was my next subspecialty. And that one took me more into the outpatient environment, still a lot of consulting in the hospital setting and ICUs and all that. But the journey in parallel to that when you're in academia is a, a typically a, a biomedical research kind of role. And so there's a lot of pressure when you're first in, you know, moving into faculty positions in academia to find that niche, find that little you know, thing that's going to become yours and you're going to become the global expert on that thing because that's really what drives funding in the in the academic environment. And so the reason I bring that up is because the great vulnerability and danger in that model is that everybody becomes sub, sub, sub specialized and you only get paid for being the expert in that sub, sub, sub specialty space and you are never asked or paid for to see the big picture. And that I think has trickled in, you know, to our kind of expertise mo motif of academia, where you're an expert in this or that, and then you're extolled for that, and you're rewarded for that, and you're awarded for that. And even early in your academia, you're programmed into this, where they tote you around, even as a med student. Oh, you've won this award, and you've won this award, and you. You know, and so it's this egoic journey into believing that your value is in being an expert 
and being one of the few experts in that thing. And that thing has to get smaller and smaller and smaller with each passing generation because you've got naturally more and more beings that are competing for dollars at the NIH or other places for dollars. So my little world became this one little protein called CoopTF1. And CoopTF1 is a regulatory protein around uh, the mitochondria, which are the, if you remember from Biology 101, the, the power plant of the human cell. And that was pretty much my understanding of it, the power plant of the human cell. And in, in learning that at you know, Biology 101 in junior high all the way through to my expertise, nobody had really stepped back to even tell me that that was a non-human entity, that, that the mitochondria didn't actually belong to the human cell. It's, it's a participant in, it's a resident within the human cell environment, but it's not human. It's a, it's a microbe, it's a bacterium. And so even being an expert of an expert of an expert down all the way down to the single protein level of the mitochondria, I was missing the big picture of even the organelle, the tiny little cell that I was within. And so I point all of that out just so that you can have a sense that the, the expression currently of Western medicine from the consumer side can look like complete idiocy. Like, really, this is where we're at? Like you walk in with gut problems and the first thing the gut doctor tells you is, well, your, your diet has nothing to do with why your gut hurts, you know? And, and as just a human being, you're just like, what? Like that makes no sense at all. And like, no, no, it's your immune system, so blah, blah, blah. So make up all these other stories. And so there's this tendency, to, to, I think, as a consumer of medicine, even when you're a doctor and end up on the patient side or your loved one ends up as a patient, when you enter it from that space, it just looks like lunacy from, from stem to stern. So I want to just start by shedding that light of the reason it looks like lunacy is because for generations now, scientists and doctors have not been paid or encouraged to think about the big picture. Mm. And so for the lack of context, our data, the science, ends up not making sense at the macro level at all. And so our, our micro explorations are failing to be grounded in the reality that we live in. And that's becoming more and more entrenched in the academic environment, not just in medicine, but really every area of quote unquote science. But I would say even really everywhere in the arts and sciences of academia, academia has become an abstract phenomenon of reality. It is not expressing the real. So that's the backdrop. So where was I at? So the mitochondria is this really ex extraordinary piece of the puzzle of how multicellular life works. And multicellular life to become possible requires an enormous amount of energy. To be a single cell that doesn't have to, you know, subspecialize and cooperate in a bigger, you know, organism takes about 10 times less energy. And so to be a bacteria or a fungi, a single-celled system, uh, a fungi is a single-celled organism. They can create pseudohyphae and, and these mycelial networks that look like a giant multicellular organism, but really it's a bunch of single cells that are just cooperating in a larger ecosystem. Uh, so the real advent or leap to a multicellular organism happened when we got protozoa and then protozoa ultimately into multicellular life. And the innovation that allowed for that leap was the mitochondria. And so up until the advent of the mitochondria, the only way to liberate energy from food was through fermentation. And fermentation is, is an anaerobic process, doesn't require oxygen. In fact, it even works better without oxygen So, in the in environment. So bacteria, fungi, all that, they're anaerobically, typically, or at least without the need of oxygen, managing the release of energy at this kind of basic fermentation process. When the mitochondria became possible, and what, what happened there was basically two bacteria inadvertently perhaps or by design uh, became a single organism and so one bacteria basically swallowed another and so a small uh, bacterium called called a, a a mycobacteria the mycobacteria swallowed a methane producing bacterium basically and then those two membranes started to suddenly cooperate to do something phenomenal which was an oxygen base or uh, a respiratory process of breaking carbon down and so instead of using fermentation, which is a, a slow digestive process for carbon, you can use this method of breaking the carbon bonds using oxygen and hydrogen. 
Uh, and so that was this huge innovation that happened. And even this week, there's new new articles coming out this this past week from uh, interesting studies being done in Mesopotamia and Egypt and all these places where um, they're starting to undercover uncover fossils that have intact mitochondrial fossil uh, remnants in there. And so our estimate of when respiratory jump happened just to move back and prove uh, another 1.5 billion years. Up until the last week's publication, our, our most, you know, our deepest evidence that that there were mitochondria inside of multicellular life was around one billion, uh, or not even like five hundred million years ago. But we know by just the the met, the process of finding fossils and knowing that there was macro life that it's probably more like three and a half billion years ago or three billion years ago, somewhere in there. This this innovation of mitochondria came about, but we hadn't been able to see those those more ancient. But this last week, I think it's now 1.6 billion years ago, evidence of the mitochondrial re- re- respiratory tree and all that. So it's a very f- fascinating moment, I think, in science where we're starting to realize that life is essentially the distillation or concentration of light energy per cubic centimeter. Physics precedes life, and so physics is basically the periodic chart. You've got lots of elements. Those elements are made of atoms that are clammed together, and those crammed together atoms have a certain number of, of atomic principles at the nucleus, and then they have a cloud of electrons that are orbiting in kind of a double torus methodology around that. But at the core of that, you either have one, one proton neutron, which would be a hydrogen, or you've got 16 at a carbon, or you know, go ahead and keep building more and more atomic structures at the core of that atomic heart, and you get more and more heavy isotopes or he- heavy elements on the periodic chart. And the heaviest ones are like plutonium-derived uranium kind of stuff and all that, those really heavy ones that, that lead to what nuclear power. So the, the more energy distilled into a single atom... The, the heavier it is on the periodic chart. And the brightest thing that, that physics does is, is that nuclear fission and fusion, and that's what we call a star or a sun in the case of uh, our galaxy here. And so that's, that star is a nuclear event that's releasing energy from the atomic potential of the periodic chart. And it's fascinating to recognize that to make the leap from star to a single bacteria, you need at least a 10x, if, you know, if not 1,000x increase in light per cubic centimeter. To get bacteria to live or get any form of life to perform, you need an extra concentration of that sunlight. You, sunlight itself is not bright enough, does not produce enough energy to sustain life. It has to be concentrated by what we now call biology. So physics becomes biology through the concentration of light energy. So that's kind of a, a <laughs> big, big background of like, what are we talking about with mitochondria? Mitochondria are the, the most profound biologic innovation in concentrating the amount of light released per cubic centimeter. And what is it? Where is that light coming from? It's ultimately sunshine that's collected by chlorophyll, which are specialized mitochondria inside of plants. And actually, we now know that we have chlorophyll-like activity even in the human body. So when you get exposed to sunshine, you can actually capture that energy as well. But that energy is sunlight stored between two carbons. And so there's a double carbon bond that, that is formed out of CO2. Two molecules of CO2 become a double carbon. And you start zippering carbons together, and you get a long chain of carbons. And then we call that a carbohydrate or a sugar, or we call it a fat, fatty acid. And there's lots of different carbohydrate structures and there's lots of different fatty acid structures, but the inherent backbone is this long carbon chain. And to get the fat or the sugar to turn it into energy for biology, you have to break the carbon bond and release the sunshine. And so when I say mitochondria are the biggest innovation in light per cubic centimeter, what's happening is you're collecting lots and lots of potential sunlight in all of the long carbon chains, glucose, sugars, fatty acids, and then you're releasing them in a very small amount of space. And current estimates are that a cubic centimeter of mitochondria, which is roughly equal to a cubic centimeter of human tissue, can release 10,000 times more sunlight 
than a cubic centimeter of the sun produces. And so a human burns 10,000 times brighter than a cubic centimeter of the sun per cubic centimeter. And so that innovation is really what allowed us to leap to this potential of an earthworm or a dinosaur or a human. We needed that much light to produce a body that could self-organize in a womb and produce a living or, or an, an alive fetus that would then, without an egg, you know, be born straight into the atmosphere of, of Earth and, and, and be a mammal. And so that innovation of multicellular life all the way marching to the mammals, all the way into, you know, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, you know, all of this, all of that took more and more and more light energy. And so that takes me to kind of the end of the story of, of my beginnings, which was I was very fascinated as an endocrinologist, which is the study of how hormones coordinate energy within the body. The specialty is actually called endocrinology and metabolism. And so as a, a medical doctor of endocrinology and metabolism, you're looking at the study of the coordination of complex multicellular life to produce energy, metabolism. And metabolism is not done by a human cell, it's done by the mitochondria living inside the human cells. And so endocrinology was this very cool field that most people still don't realize, even endocrinologists being trained today, don't realize that they are being trained into ecosystem science. And it took me you know, 10 years to, to figure that out. But, but the exciting thing that really started to happen for me was I started to realize that disease is simply a, a reduction in that light energy. Disease doesn't happen to a healthy human body. Disease is a symptom of a reducing light potential within that, that previously healthy human body. And so that started taking my medical career that this time I'd been in academia by, for 17 years or something. And I had been basically trained to believe that the human body is super complex and disease is super complex. And so we need really complex biologic chemical science to produce man-made chemicals to modify disease so that you can get somebody back there. And so I had this just ludicrously complex map in my head of like a human body, human biology, mitochondrial metabolism, respiratory and, and functional enzyme pathways, disease pathways, drug pathways, like... It, I almost want to just vomit when I think about how much stuff I had crammed in my head about all this new, you know, nuanced detail. And then suddenly around 2008 in my, in my science lab, I was starting to really make some breakthroughs around nutrition or nutrients to kill cancer cells. And the place that they were interacting was around this tiny little protein, CUPTF1 as a regulatory step for the mitochondria to either decide to sustain the life within the human cell or to eliminate life for the human cell. And that, that process is called apoptosis or programmed cell suicide. And what I was realizing is that I could actually feed cancer cells really high nutrient density and kill them. And it wasn't a poisoning, it was a feed them so much that they realize that they are an unhealed cell and they eliminate themselves. So they literally will just dissolve through that apoptosis. It looks almost like bubble tea where the cell just like turns into all these tiny, tiny little bubbles and gently disappears. Doesn't require an immune cell, doesn't require inflammation. It just simply releases life. And now, you know, 20 years later, when I'm sitting with all these indigenous wisdom keepers from around the world, you find out that's how we used to do it at the macro level. You would wake up one morning and realize, oh, this is my last day. You would go for a walk in the woods, find your five favorite tree, release the body, and you are gone. That's what a cancer cell or a damaged human cell is capable of when it's given enough nutrient. It knows its endpoint and it releases it gently. It says, ah, I can't reproduce anymore. I can, I can no longer repair myself anymore. I have reached the end of my useful contribution to the larger organism that we would call human. And so I'm going to release this, this human identity as a cell, and I'm going to go back into the ethers and to replace me as a brand new stem cell that's going to make a new, new liver cell or a new gut cell or whatever it is. So that's the dance that I've been on over these years, I think, in a long-winded <laughs> answer to your very first question, which is light is really the definition of 
reality, I would say. So what makes a physical reality is light and its many expressions. The difference between physics and biology is a concentration of light energy by at least a thousand fold to make single cell and 10,000 fold to make multicellular life possible. And where we find ourselves now is at this diminishing light threshold of humanity, which is leading to this explosion of disease. Okay, so there's a lot that was just raised there. The realization that we are literally beings of light, which is outside of it just being fun to say, is a, <laughs> is a powerful realization when we look at the widespread um, diseases that are happening right now where you kind of spoke to how we can get so nuanced and specialized into trying to treat an actual disease with our nuanced understanding of certain um, minute details, but you're like inviting a macro look at the at the human being um from a more holistic sense and how disease can, I just want you to dive a little bit deeper into the liberation of light in the human cell. Uh, and also we can go into the dimming of it, right? Because mm -hmm. the dimming of metabolism due to glyphosate in the chemical industry at large is a huge contributor to that metabolism uh, diminishing. So I would love for you to lay the ground of glyphosate, the dimming of our metabolism and then the liberation of that light. Yeah. So the light energy as it's released from the mitochondria is um, the mitochondria are little bacteria that are really curious in structure. Actually, they you know we if you've ever like seen a little biology video about bacteria, you're used to seeing the little you know oblong globs. Maybe they have a tail, maybe they don't, and they kind of bump it, and they maybe have a fuzzy little boundary and border and all this stuff. Mitochondria are much more unique looking. They, as they've become more and more capable of producing more and more energy, they turn in these very oblong and sometimes folded structures within the human cell. And so when you do electron microscopy to, to identify the mitochondria inside of a human cell, it always gives me goosebumps because it looks, it looks far more inner city like than than you would expect it looks like somebody went and designed a subway system inside your cells right it's like so structural in its tubes and it's you know it's just it always kind of creeps me out because it's like man that is so tiny number one like you're looking at a, a cell within a human cell that's down at just a few microns so a human cell is maybe anywhere from 10 to 100 microns across in size and, and you could have 200, on average, you have 200 mitochondria inside every single human cell. And they have to live within a very certain compartment within that cell, which is called the cytoplasm. So they can't live in the nucleus. And so they have to, they're kind of crammed into this cytoplasmic environment. If you go to a biology textbook, it always shows you two mitochondria inside the human cell. Like these are the power plants. Like if they actually drew all the mitochondria inside the cell, you wouldn't be able to see anything else. And so they'd be like, well, somewhere deep in between all those mitochondria is a human nucleus. But uh, so we depict it as if they're rare within the human environment, they, but they really are the human cell. Like they are just cram full in the cytoplasm. And they fold into each other to make more room. And I mean, it's just very maximized for efficiency. And, and so these, these things crammed inside your cells are pumping the glucose and fatty acids, the, the long chain carbons, through their membranes to break apart the carbons back into CO2. And to do that, it needs water. And, and when I say water, I'm really talking about hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, H2O is is the ratio at which hydrogen and oxygen occur in a liquid state of water or a crystal state of water. But it's never actually H2O as a molecule. Like it's always OH. There's always an extra hydrogen out there. And the oxygen is at, at about a million times a second, it's exchanging, you know, to it's binding to another hydrogen. And so there's this ethereal environment inside a, a living cell in which the water has become a crystalline gel-like structure, just like jello. Um, the, the difference between the liquid that you're preparing for jello and then the jello is that that sudden solidification. That's what happens when you move from a bloodstream, which is liquid pouring through my body, into the human cell. It now is not water. Um, I, I cut myself a couple days ago uh, when I was picking oranges out of a tree and, and it caught the back of my thumb and wow, immediately blood was coming out, but absolutely no water came out. And I, in that single cut on the back of my thumb probably disrupted you know, a couple million, you know, skin cells, all of which are 70% water by volume. 
and yet none of that water leaked out of my body. And the reason why you can cut yourself open and water doesn't come pouring out is because all that water is in a jello state. And so there's that gelatin-like structure. The gelatin will turn back into liquid once if you know if the injury is deep enough. And so you actually can see this with like a twisted ankle, right? And so the, you, you twist an ankle and immediately there's pain. You just tore a bunch of tissue in there. Billions of cells maybe got ripped in a big fall and you and you're like, oh my God, you can hardly walk on immediate pain, immediate thing. But it takes hours before it starts to swell. And the swelling happening hours later is the slow dissolution of the gel into liquid again. And so that, that late edema phase is, is the liquid accumulating from all those damaged cells um, coming back out of the gel state, and then it's attracting to it repair. So now the bloodstream is dumping plasma in there and a bunch of other liquids and all that. But it takes time for that transition to happen because what that light energy is that's being produced by the mitochondria is doing is allowing for structure to occur. So it's taking basically a chaotic environment of water cells bouncing around in the liquid state into a crystal. And so light is the beginning of your journey into syntropy in some ways. Syntropy is a phys physics word that means order out of chaos. And so from a chaotic water liquid state, you're coming into order when you go and become a human cell or as you organize energy within that human cell. And so as you start to think these mitochondria cranking out light energy, what you're really starting to experience is the opportunity for physical properties to organize into new complex you know, order. And that order, just like you would find in a diamond ring or a crystal that you just pulled out of the earth, the crystalline structures are very unique in their properties depending on which elements are in the crystal, right? So you could have quartz crystal or you could have a diamond or you could have, you know, Hittite or any of these many different, you know, minerals and, and that make the crystals that you would find in any hippie shop in Boulder where I grew up. All of those different things are going to create different shapes, different colors, different resonance frequencies to those crystals depending on which, which minerals are in there. And your human environment is much like this. And so you are literally organizing structure, creating more and more high levels of complex order as you have more and more light to play with. And so the mitochondria are generating light by breaking double carbon bonds through the use of, of the release of energy from water. And for that release of energy, the water is able to keep reaching these higher and higher complex levels of, of structure and complexity. And for that, we get to start to shape life. And the very first things that start to shape once you get complex water crystals is proteins. And proteins uh, can start to fold in these very complicated crystalline structures within those, those water plasma environments of the cell and the gel-like state. And, and protein folding is one of the most mysterious freaking things that we, we have ever tried to wrap our heads around as scientists. And we just ultimately don't know how it happens. But a, a single long strand of RNA that's copied from your DNA inside your cells is carrying all the genetic potential of a gene. And we now know a single gene can become 200 different proteins depending on the signals from your environment. And this is called epigenetics. And so the breath you take, the air you breathe, the toxins are not toxins, the nutrients are not nutrients. All of those things are deciding which protein is this gene going to make today. And so we have a very scant number of human genes, 20,000 genes. But we can make over 400,000 different proteins from just those mere 20,000 genes because of this freedom to decide in the moment. And that decision is being happened, uh, is happening in the plasma state, in, in the liquid crystalline structure of your waters that are informed and allowed to become more and more complex by the amount of light energy in there. And so I think that, you know, I hope that what you're starting to feel is a fascination for life as a concentration of light. Light as a concentration becomes an, uh, a form or order function that allows you to start building more and more complexity. In, the, in that space, you start to be able to fold proteins, fold DNA, fold nucleotides in more and more complex sacred geometry, basically. And that uh, the reason I say sacred geometry is because we keep finding at the core of all of these things, whether it be a single protein or a DNA double strand 
or the possibility of a, of a, a quaternary strand or four-stranded DNA, which we are now finding, or 12-stranded DNA, which has been talked about for millennia. If, if we really have the patience to look down into the water structure of life, we find the same sacred geometry that's depicted in you know, every religion that's ever been out there from the Kabbalah tree and, and, and the study of, of Kabbalah back in ancient Hebrew times or Babylonian scriptures or ancient Chinese depictions. Like it just doesn't matter which people group you go back in. At the macro level, we were depicting in our spiritual art, in our architecture, designs that we're now finding in the water structures of human cells now that we have the technology to look deep enough inside of ourselves to find out that we are probably the original temple. We are that original design of this most complex expression of light interacting with water, interacting with protein or the expression of building blocks of life itself. And for that, we built these temples that we call bodies, you know, and it's for all of that that I have ultimately closed my clinic. I have let go of my my prescription capacity as a doctor. I can no longer prescribe drugs because I am convinced the only thing I can really do with a, a drug now is harm. I There is no way that a human, myself or otherwise, is going to find a new chemical that is going to change the potential or capacity of that temple to do itself better. It, I just wholly now understand that to be absolutely an impossible premise because the design was so perfect at its origin. And any disease is a decrement away from that original design, not a failure of the design that now needs to be improved. And that is, in a nutshell, my last 35 years was realizing, boy, I can study the hell out of I can become the number one doctor in the world, I can become the number one academician in the world, and I will never improve that original design. And furthermore, that entire seven years in academia gave me absolutely no tools in the toolbox to get back, get people back to their original design. And so if I don't have something in my toolbox to get you back to your original design, then I am not a healer. I am a technician for a pharmaceutical chemical industrial complex, and there can be pros and cons to that. It's not a judgment. It's just that's what we should be called, not doctors, you know, not physicians. We should be called drug technicians for a medical, you know, pharmaceutical industrial complex. Because that's all I could do was to hand out more drugs that were n none of them naturally occurring compounds. They were naturally occurring compounds perhaps at one time in their imagination. And then they got perturbed into these broken, defined, refined, reduced versions of nature so that they could be patented and so they could be sold and all the usual typical things that are necessary in, in our current economics. But the the excitement that I have now, you know, fast forward 13 years after leaving academia is, oh my gosh, every single person that walks into my clinic or my life has inside of them the original design. And they, they have an original metric within them of how far they are from that, that original design. And they have a, a blueprint on how to get back to that original design. And so that's what my fascination has become over the last 13 years is how do we get people back into that right relationship with light energy, which ultimately has led me back into understanding it. we have to get back into right relationship with microbes. Certainly the mitochondria within us is, is ground zero at the human biology side, but those mitochondria need to be fed. And to get those mitochondria nurtured, they need their cousins in the microbiome of the gut and ultimately on the skin and every other organ and system that holds the microbiome it needs a direct relationship back to that nature, back to the soil systems of the body, which are then directly connected to the literal soil systems around us. And that's how I have found myself slowly back to this you know, cross-section, I think, of my career. Of Now I can't think about human health without thinking about planetary health because the two are intrinsically linked and cannot be split. And so when we see a chronic disease epidemic in humans, as we do today, we know that there was a break in our right relationship with nature itself at the soil level, at the microbiome level, ultimately deteriorating that, that mitochondrial potential within us. And for that, the temple is going dim. So much we can open up there. That was so lovely. Thank you for sharing. The, so, so it sounds like for our listeners, to ground this in, like the, the realization is the temple within is going dim. And 
the, the reasons for that. And, um, and so how, how would you say like this understanding of what you're sharing, its implications and behavioral changes for our listener? Like what, what is the power of this understanding and how it actually affects how we live? Yeah. Um, so many layers to that, that seemingly simple question. But the, if we look back in human history, we can recognize that disease has always been with us, right? We can, as far back as there's records, there's been some mention of disease somewhere in the mix. So it's not like this new relationship to a dim biology that produces disease is new. What's happened is there's been an acceleration of that. And so we're seeing disease at a much younger rate now. We're seeing children born with disease. We are seeing two-year-olds with cancers that we hadn't seen. When I started training, osteosarcoma was seen in 85-year-olds. Now we have whole hospital suites down in Texas Children's Hospital for osteosarcoma in three-year-olds. So you know, the speed at which we are are decrementing our light energy within the human temple there is is really kind of astonishing. But it's not new in its phenomenon. So what does start to break that relationship at that light level of the mitochondrial production and then its capacity to build this hierarchical, you know, complexity or centropy uh, within your water systems, protein systems, right? It turns out that it's basically in a nutshell, you could think of the word coherence, I suppose, but as you lose coherence of the the light within the body, you can imagine this kind of like static in a television. If you're old enough to have remembered TV before, you know, cable satellite, I guess, we used to have these things called rabbit ears on top of every TV, these antenna, and maybe you've seen them on, if you've never seen it in person, you've seen it in a comic strip or something like that. But these little bunny ears were sitting on, on top of every television, and if you turn to CBS or your channel six or whatever, you're, you're trying to tune in, you, you would have to adjust the antenna slightly to get the static out of the image. The static is discoherent or non, non-belonging information that's entering that channel or that station that you're trying to tune into. And you can experience this on, a, on an FM dial, actually. I guess you, don't, you can't see that anymore either. But Um, nonetheless, when you're trying to tune into a single station or a channel of information, you need coherence. And to do that, you need the antenna to be very well tuned to the information that you're trying to receive. Each human body has complex antenna within it. And that antenna is actually the DNA itself. And so when a double stranded DNA peels apart, it literally looks like rabbit ears. It has these two long ends on it that then stick out into the vibration of the environment. And those two long ends vibrating are going to either very clearly say, I am human, this is my identity, this is my body, I remember self, and it's going to go and heal itself to its full potential or recreate itself, stem cells, et cetera, et cetera. Or there's going to be misinformation and static in the field and the the DNA won't quite figure out what am I supposed to be right now. And so it might realize, well, I must be damaged then. And so I'm going to make a repair thing or I'm going to trigger inflammation. I'm going to start to try to regenerate a, a, a damaged system here. And so the that deep self-identity depends on how clear of a signal are you getting from the original vibration of self, if you will. And and the things that start to introduce the static are pretty well, you know, predictable based on your own life. You've experienced these things. You can do it without any contact with the outside environment. You can do it through the mind. Stress, lack of sleep, uh, fear, guilt, shame, these disempowering emotions that we've learned to program each other with in our egoic minds are the are the, some of the most potent ways to introduce static to the antenna. And so now suddenly you're not able to go back to your original design and you produce some sort of decrement or diseased version of previous self because you can't quite get the clear signal. And so that's basically how disease starts to accumulate is stress in the system of some sort. Static being that stress starts to misshape your re-expression of self. Aging is a slow forgetting of who you are, basically. Aging is this decremental expression of a physical body that's losing touch with the original design that happened inside the womb. And I see myself aging, and I'm fascinated by that. I'm like, wow, I am literally, because of my human mind and my abstract belief systems of who I am, 
designing a body that is disconnected or discordant or static filled compared to the thing that helped me self-organize 70 trillion cells into my human body inside the womb of my mother. And so as a physician, it's been my fascination to start to, to look back into that womb and, and for myself and say, what are the aspects of myself? And you can almost do this physically where you just like look back in time to your left and look deep back into that womb space and, and start to just inquire there. Feel that for yourself. Like what, what was the sensation of becoming self? becoming a physical manifestation of something ancient, something perfectly designed before biology became real for in my mother's womb, my physical self must have known itself very well because it was able to pull biology to it and organize it in this complex quaternary structure that we would call a human body. So what did that feel like to be inside the womb? And everything that we've seen heal people really is, is, is taking back into a womb-like experience. Silence, meditation, breath work, you know, the, the um, powerful, you know, therapies of, of uh, what, I, what I would call float medicine where you can go into a float tank and literally just be in silence floating in a magnesium bath that's so full of salt that it's like, you know, 100 times saltier than the ocean. And in these plasma states of liquid, you start to heal, you start to do repair. And so the closer you can bring your own physical environment into this, and now you're seeing it come out of, you know, fortunately, I think the, the biohacking era of like everybody needed a glucose monitor and aura rings and all this, we're starting to realize, no, 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 you need to be in silence. You need a cold bath and you need, a, you know, a hot sauna. You know, you need the elements to take you into silence and listening at the cellular level of who was I before I had my first emotion that started to deprogram my original design. And so that, that process is really exciting to me of like, we're going to start backing this up, backing this up, backing this up into this womb-like experience. And I can simply just check in with my own embryo every day now, just to, you know, gentle look to the left, look into my womb state, and wonder at it, like, what can you inform me? Can you, can I, re what can I remember back into the womb, which was just a fraction of time ago? It was only 50 years ago that I was in that womb. And humans have been around 300,000 years. Life's been around 4 billion on the planet. So, my goodness, 50 years ago, that's like, I, I should have a very clear connect to that original mathematical design of the womb. And so, it's an interesting inquiry thing for all of us is, what have I come to believe that allows me to age in disease that I didn't believe then, you know, that I did not know then? And in that same way, the science has gotten really exciting because that's kind of at the macro physician level. But at the scientist level, I have gotten very excited with my colleagues that, that now run the biomedical lab that I launched after I left the university, tiny little rural clinic, no money. We decided we were going to start this little biotech lab, ten thousand um, dollars, four hundred one k cashed in. Start start this little lab, so goofy, and <laughs> immediately we were getting results and and answers at the science level that we could not have imagined. You know, just a few months earlier in the academic setting, because we were simply listening instead of expecting. I think that's the wound of the academician that needs to get the grant, do the protein, to do the thing is. You got to prove something. You got to be the expert in that. Once I left the academia and I started to be able to just be like, what the hell is a mitochondria? What is light energy? What, where does this all begin? And how does it relate to the ecosystems? Then we could start to study the impact of ecosystem information back into the human system and just watch and observe. And finally, I was becoming a real scientist because the real scientist doesn't go in with an agenda. A real scientist goes in with just pure curiosity. And that, I think, is what's been robbed from academia as a whole, is curiosity as a driving element. Children at a very young age now are taught that school is about get the grades so you can get to the university, so you can get the jobs, so you can get the things, so you can get the cars, so you can get the house, so you can do the thing, and you can have the family, and then you can die. Where is the kid set and told that, welcome to a world where you are alive? 
you have a driving force inside of you from an original design of a temple that now vibrates in light frequency and your purpose is to be really freaking curious. And out of that curiosity, you're going to find your divine right to create. Well, that would be a slightly different message that I could have heard in kindergarten or in my graduating you know, day of medical school, and I never heard it. I never heard curiosity extolled in the academic environment, and that's a, a terrifying reality. And now, as a scientist, I get to, you know, be joined by scientists that are far smarter and far better at basic science research than I ever was. Now, running our lab, and uh, Zhishan Wang is just, uh, he's our, our daily uh, director of the lab, and he just does a phenomenal job. He's an MD, PhD out of China. And his capacity for patience of setting up the study and listening into to the vibration of nature through that uh, is just revealed to us again and again, year after year, some of the most astonishing realities of nature. And you mentioned, you know, glyphosate, which is uh, our lab's area of expertise. If we have one, it's it's in the relationship of glyphosate, which is the primary herbicide or weed killer on the planet, and human systems, mitochondria being one of those, but also bacteria and, and the human cell structures themselves, human proteins, not just mitochondria. And so that's been our fascination over the years of how does the chemical industry add to this emotional, psychological belief that we are separate from nature? And the answer is every chemical we tend to put into our environment tends to further deepen the wound, break our relationship, break the direct relationship to that light energy somewhere in the core. And glyphosate is now the most ubiquitous chemical on the planet. Four billion pounds of that chemical are poured into our water, soil, and air systems every single year now globally. And so if, you, if we want to know ground zero right now from our break in our relationship to nature, I would give it that single chemical name, glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, which is probably on the shelf of every garage of everybody that's listening right now. Um, but uh, Roundup glyphosate is the chemical machete that cuts the relationship between soil and its life within it, the microbes, as well as the protein structures within our gut, leading to leaky gut, leaky brain, leaky kidneys, all of this stuff. And so um, I picture it literally as a machete. It goes through and just starts cutting relationships. And so ultimately the isolation that has to occur for disease to be prevalent or for can a single cancer cell to occur, you have to cut so many relationships. You have to create so much isolation in that cell so that it can become cancerous. Cancer is ultimately the penultimate loss of self-identity because you are so far from that womb-like you know, remembrance that you only know survival at all costs. And the all costs is death itself. And so you are willing to kill the organism itself in the effort to preserve the single cell because it has so lost its original identity. And so this is... Our journey at this point is realizing, wow, we have, as a technological food system in our dependence on chemicals, engineered a moment where humanity would completely forget itself and therefore express disease and extinction. And the exciting thing about knowing that is that we can change direction. <laughs> So this is ultimately empowering when you realize the simplicity of healing of, you know, exposure to the elements, proper nutrition, sleep, these things that bring the body back into its original math or coherent state. But now living in society that we live in, it becomes, what well, used to be so simple, becomes much more complicated when the nutrition and the food that we would have eaten is now tainted with the glyphosate or the myriad of different ways in which the chemical industry or pharmaceutical complex uh, makes healing such a, what was once simple process, much more complicated. And so what are the most empowering realizations of how we can keep glyphosate just out of our own system, first mm -hmm. and foremost, to just really ground this in as, you know, in, in practical takeaways for, for individuals. Um, what would you say there? Um, the belief that we needed herbicides, you know, weed killers as part of our food system was a falsehood. 
And so that's really good news. We, we don't need weed killers to grow food. Um, we did not have weed killers up until the 1950s, and they weren't necessary because the plants were robust in the world. We, we undermined soil health with the Dust Bowl, the 1920s, 30s, 40s. We undermined the health of the soils globally by over-tilling, over-disking the land, and by breaking all of those mycelial networks, breaking all the root systems over and over and over again. We destroyed nutrient delivery and nutrient cooperation and creation within soil systems, and therefore plants became weak. With the Green Revolution, we figured out if we just poured enough nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK fertilizer uh, from fossil fuels, so we would take oil out of the ground, turn it into NPK fertilizer, poured on dead dirt, and plants would suddenly grow better. Well, that convinced us we had cracked the code on life of like, oh, if there's enough NPK, then the plants will just be better and we don't have to worry about you know, changing our behavior otherwise. So we started plant pulling, pouring in MPK fertilizers and we got green crops and they were growing faster than they'd ever grown because we were basically ex putting the, the, the fuel on the fire or the accelerant of biology and light energy uh, in there, but we weren't providing the nutrients. We were just the, pouring gasoline on the fire, but we weren't giving it more wood, you know? And so there was no more carbon left in the soil systems by the 1970s and 80s. And so by forcing the fire to burn without extra wood, we had basically burned everything to ash inside the, the cell. The wood is a carbon source for a fire. Uh, it's long chain carbons, glucose, carbohydrates, fatty acids, oils, etc. And so the, the chunk of wood is, you know, for the fire is the same thing as carbon nutrients and, and all of that for a soil system, or it's the same thing as, you know, a mushroom or a steak in my belly. Lots of potential energy caught up in fats and carbohydrate structures and all of this. And so... Uh, we depleted the fire system by the 1980s, and for this, you know, really by the 1960s, plants were starting to grow at fast rates with weak immune systems. They didn't have nutrient density, and with a weak immune system, plants become very vulnerable to invasive, you know, uh, competition with weeds. Weeds inherently are looking to help improve biodiversity. Our monoculture cropping of corn and soybean and potatoes and everything else we were monocropping in the 1950s was undermining that biologic rule of biodiversity and our soils were lacking nutrients. And so the only option for nature at that point is to attack. You need more life, more diversity in there. So you get insects to come and wipe out monoculture. You get insects to come wipe out any plant that has a weakened immune system. And then you get weeds coming in to try to create the, the nutrient diversity, biodiversity necessary for any square meter of soil. And then we blamed the insects and we blamed the weeds as if they were the problem when in fact they were nature's answer to our breaking of the biologic code of diversity. And so we started spraying the weeds with herbicides. And so my encouragement to humanity is we never needed these chemicals until we broke the rules of biology. We can stop breaking the rules of biology and we can start to foster biodiversity in every meter of soil. And for you guys listening, that has to start with you. That has to start in your home. How are you going to start creating more diversity in your living room? You need plants in there. You need some plants living in there. You need some moss growing in there. You need to start getting life back in there. And the second you step out of your home, where's your diversity at? Is there a pot growing a tomato on the on the patio or on the front stoop? Is there you know an opportunity to tear up all that Kentucky bluegrass and start planting a food forest in your front yard, in your backyard? How are you going to start... A, playing the, the rule of life, playing the game of life, which is biodiversification at every opportunity. And when you start to play that game, the role for herbicides and insecticides and pesticides all go away because the plants that are now in that biologic diversity are so robust, there's no threat to them. The insects don't come by. There's no need for invasive weeds anymore because you've already created the biodiversity there. So my great encouragement to everybody, homeowner to farmer to, to government agent, is that there is an easy way to step back into right relationship with nature. To be in right relationship to nature as a species that's multicellular and intelligent, we must be the best pollinators, we must be the best uh, you know, co-creators with the potential of life to push for biodiversity at every single moment. And if we wake up wondering what we can birth today, if we wake up wondering what kind of beauty can we bring in through diversification of our environment today, 
we're going to end up with a completely different civilization, totally different societal expression of humanity, total different, totally different personal expression of my spirituality, my physicality, my emotionality. If I wake up every morning wondering what I can birth today, most of us are trained steadily to, to question what do I need to kill today instead. And as a doctor, that looks like antibiotics, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, anti-everything. And so that's unfortunately what the you know, reductionist approach to the pharmaceutical industry is. Well, we need to kill the insects in the farm. We need to kill the weeds. Then we now have weak plants, weak humans eating those plants. And the humans now have invasive weeds that we call microbes or invasive bacteria. And so we need antibiotics over there. And, oh, my gosh, we, we need more antibiotics on the farm because there's now fun, fungus killing our orchards and blah, blah, blah. And so from farmer to physician to consumer, we're really trained into what can we kill today attitude. And for that, we're becoming more and more isolated, more and more lonely as a species, uh, more and more lo lonesome as a biology. And therefore, we're expressing cancer at this insane rate and on our way to cancer, we get obesity first, then diabetes, then autoimmunity, then then I'd say bone marrow dysfunction next, and then after that, you end up with you know deeper dysfunctions in regards to chronic pain syndromes, degenerative neurologic conditions, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementias, movement disorders, chronic pain syndrome, chronic regional pain syndromes. Like all of this didn't exist in 1992 when I started. You know, my, my medical training, it all happened in the 1990s, 2000s. And so um, we have this excitement for me, I think, of right relationship with nature, rebirthing the biodiversity around us, rebirthing biodiversity at the cellular level. And that's been our joy at the lab is to show that this actually can be proven in the scientific world that if you take the diversity of ancient soil systems not touched by human hands. So we go back about 60 million years ago to the kind of the richest soil deposits that Earth has provided us. And we take extracts of that and add that back to human cells that have been damaged by glyphosate. And what you immediately see is healing. And so nature is the antidote to humanity's wounds. And I'm fascinated by that grace. I'm fascinated by that beauty of her message, which is you cannot actually make a mistake too big for me. That's nature's little sweet message every day is, oh, you screw up? No problem, I'm bigger. And that's ultimately what a mother does. And the mother never freaks out at a kid for not eating you know, their vegetables today because, you know, and, Frustrating as heck, you won't eat your broccoli, but you know what? Tomorrow you're going to grow up and you're going to start eating broccoli. And so nature is waiting for us to start eating the broccoli, ultimately. You know, nature is waiting for us to get past our infantile tantrums of, well, I want this, I deserve that, I do this, blah, blah, and, and just start to receive from her. And so I have, on my scientific journey, I think finally started to relax into a journey towards abundance. And whether we go extinct as our current expression of humanity or not, is starting to become a little bit irrelevant to my emotional journey. It's more like what comes after that gets super interesting to me. We are now in our hospice moment. We are so dim as a species now that we, we, we are going extinct. And the way that that looks biologically is ultimately a failure of fertility. Uh, one in three males in Western countries are now infertile by sperm count. One in three. Um, that's a that's about a seventy five percent drop in in sperm counts over the last fifty years in, in Western countries. And we're we haven't flattened that curve out. It's still diving straight down. And so we will likely be at one and two by twenty thirty, twenty thirty five, somewhere in that that's zone. Crazy. And when fifty percent of your species is infertile. And the likelihood of fertility in the best of times is only 50%. Now you're down at like 25%. Now you have collapsing uh, populations all over the world. And this is already happening in China. It's already happening in the United States. It's already starting to trend that way. In India, one of our fastest growing populations globally, historically, is now plateauing. And so we are seeing the end of times in regards to the human thing because we can no longer birth ourselves. And when we fail in fertility, the species ultimately disappears. And so we're in our hospice moment. 
some people are estimating that you know we probably have sixty to eighty years left at, at best case scenario for for human fertility and and survival in, in the way of our capacity to to procreate. And that includes in a test tube. Like test tube fertility still relies on the the ultimate genetics within the cell, and and it's inside the genetics of the cell that we set off the nuclear bomb of the chemical industry and everything else that's now now playing out as infertility. It's DDT back in the day. It's glyphosate. It's atrazine. It's two four D. It's Agent Orange. It's all the chemicals that we pour poured into our environment since the nineteen forties and fifties. So. Um, we are now the genetic consequences of all of that cumulative trauma at the human genomic level. So we can't, when we find ourselves unable to have children, so we go to the fertility clinic, quote unquote. Fertility clinics should not be called fertility clinics. They should be called last ditch, ditch effort for humanity clinics. Uh, because you, if as soon as a sperm can no longer naturally go and, and fertilize an egg, you've lost all the fundamentals of, of vitality already. And so now if you go force that in a test tube to produce a baby, that baby inherently is at a lower energetic level. And so they're starting with a, a lower deck of cards because the cells that birthed them were artificially allowed to do that. They were dim, therefore they could not do it themselves. They didn't have the protein, you know, synthesis allowing uh, the sperm to be modal enough. Didn't have the egg, you know, fertile enough to be able to support the the entry of the sperm. Didn't have enough zinc inside the cell to do the light explosion that happens at the moment of fertility. If you haven't seen that, by the way, just check that out. On I think you can Google that zinc. Um, light burst at at moment of conception. It's unbelievably beautiful, uh, but it's been captured many times in many labs around the world now. That w- as soon as a, a sperm successfully introduces its its vitality into a an ovum, the ovum goes literally into this supernova bright flash, and it's a flash that's so bright per cubic centimeter again that. Uh, you know, a lot of people are calling this the God moment. This is the moment where consciousness arrives inside that cell. Consciousness is simply a description of enough light energy for biology, for life to do its centropy moment. And so that spark, and it's known to, to happen through these zinc molecules that are, uh, or these zinc atoms that are lined up within that that embry- embryonic moment. And that zinc really, you know, catalyzes this this massive, you know, lightning bolt of, of energy through that cell. And at that moment, centropy occurs, and the potential for that life comes into that cell. And so, when we start to fail in that that initial spark of life within us, and we start to force that in a test tube, all we're really doing is kicking the can down the road to you know, of extinction at that point. So what must we do now if we are to be discharged from hospice, which delightfully happens pretty often in the hospice world? Um, at least 10% of patients admitted to hospice with three weeks to three months to live have to be discharged nine months later because they found new life within themselves and have now designed a new body and no longer have the disease that was killing them and they go on to live a new chapter of life. And so we have the option, I believe, at this time to be discharged from hospice. We know enough about the the physics and quantum physics and ultimately the biology of life itself that we could realign our human expression with an original design that dwells within each of us that allowed us to knit ourselves together in the womb of our mothers we can absolutely realign and in that realignment we can birth something that hasn't happened in generations and maybe hasn't happened since really near the origin of humanity itself because very early in that human journey we have record in the anthrop- anthropologic histories and everything else that we had the egoic belief that we were separate and so we warred against each other we killed one another we killed the planet beneath our own feet we hunted to extinction animals all around us that were bigger and looked threatening to us. And so we have been doing the fear, guilt, shame pattern of human biology since our origin perhaps, which gets me super excited because we could actually, instead of remembering ourselves to the point of repeating history, we could remember ourselves to the point of a new history. And that's really compelling. And it's really the only thing that we have left because we cannot repeat history now. We just go extinct. And so I sit here with you in such curiosity, 
with you again as a friend and a colleague because there's something in you that drives you to the curiosity to want to sit in conversation with another person on another podcast and sit for hours listening to my monologues that probably last an hour each. You have a curiosity within you, which makes me believe when I see that spark of light inside of you, whether we be sitting here in your, your beautiful home here or you know traveling Egypt together a few months ago, what I see in you is light. I see in you, Andre, a being that is remembering self constantly, always returning to self, returning to self, and then you kind of get off the beaten path because you're human like me, and then we have to come into fellowship and we have to do crazy adventures and pyramids and everything else to remind each other you're bigger than you, you are being told. You are more powerful than the world wants you to know. You have an original design in you that is so perfect that no human being can change or perturb the perfection within you. And can I be witness to you aligning deeper to self? And that's ultimately what we got to do in fellowship with those 30 or 40 people we were with in Egypt is holding ourselves in the opportunity for realignment to something more ancient than this physical life. Can you remember what you were before this physical life in the womb? Yes, but what, what, what before that womb moment? What before that womb moment? What star were you? What you know, cosmic experience were you? What other life did you maybe experience on this planet or somewhere else? How far back can we go in our memory bank to express something that perhaps has been forgotten as a possibility? And for that, I'm really honored to be in fellowship with you and to the, everybody on this listening right now. You guys are each tuning into this podcast because your higher self or your past self or your womb self knew that you were ready for the message of return. You can return to something so much more vast, so much more perfect, and so true that it can never be changed. No matter how much glyphosate's on the planet, no matter how much human guilt, shame, fear we might play into that story of chemical dependence and extinction and climate crisis and all this stuff that's being thrown at you, none of that diminishes your capacity to be something completely new right now in your remembrance of something deeper than the human journey that we have in our histories. And so this is our moment to see each other. And it's an honor for me to be witness to your constant co-creation of self. And uh, I feel like when I get to see the purest version of you, because you and I haven't been blessed with you know thousands of hours of social time together, but in the, in the times that we have spent, when I watch you tune a guitar and just play in the corner, not, not to anybody, you just tune it up and you're playing away in the corner, where I walk in and you're playing piano in, in your home. That's a being that is aligning with information within the universe, within itself, to re-express itself to some sort of higher design than anybody can ultimately tell you on a podcast or tell you in a conversation or tell you in a textbook or tell you in a classroom or anything else. And so I, I celebrate in you, Andre, the musician within you, because in that is this nonverbal connection to the vibration that your antenna at the DNA level is picking up. And as you tune into self, as you clean up the vibrational frequencies you're playing in, your biology is, is remembering itself back into some sort of higher order, higher temple design. Uh, and it won't surprise me if it's if you or one of your colleagues that it becomes that first human that Course of Miracles and many other bodies of wisdom have said will occur in this time. Somebody is going to complete the original design. And in that moment, they will be seen by another who is completing their design. And when two human beings finally get to see each other, there will be so much beauty witnessed that the frequency of love created will be so profound that it will transmute the possibility and potential of human biology across the entire species, which will change the vibration of the entire planet, which will then have immediate ripple effect through the entire cosmos and universe. And so this is the promise of, of prophecies from indigenous peoples and everything else is Andre has the potential to be seen. And when somebody sees him, it, they will be just so dumbfounded by the beauty they see that they will have no choice but resonate in a frequency of love that's never been achieved before. And that will be the transformational moment that forgives, literally forgives the whole human journey into our poisoning of self, poisoning of humanity, poisoning of the planet. And we get to remember this glory that is within you. 
I don't even know how to respond to that. It was just so profound from, from beginning to end. First off, thank you. It's an honor and joy to be here with you and to see you, seeing me, seeing you <laughs> <laughs> in this great mirror and reflection of consciousness and what you're speaking to of both the catastrophic devastation of humans uh, approaching this extinction and hospice moment for humanity, but also on the flip side, the great capacity that we have in this moment for remembrance, to remember self and that we get to be the example for others to be in the presence of that, that then inspires them to become, to, to go on that journey as well, that there are things that we can do um, just by being in this conversation, feel more and more coming into a coherent vibration and resonance that inherently, like the intelligence of nature, heals itself, right? You said there's no mistake. We can't make that nature isn't too big to, to heal and to fix and to be witness to. And so it feels like so sad on one hand, the level of devastation and destruction that's happening on the planet, planetarily and also individually, but then also uh, just so profoundly inspiring at the capacity in which we can face shift, at the capacity in which we can completely reverse the damage that has been done. And I feel, you know, we are always in a da balance and dance between which story, which narrative we're listening to, which timeline are we embracing. Uh, individually and what are we stewarding in our in our communities also and uh, so thank you for being a steward for the intelligence of nature to uh, to be able to spread versus the egoic human intellect which is going to try to continue to fix the problems from the same level of consciousness that created it in the first place <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's just a new possibility that I am uh, I'm blessed to be witness to and and partake in and so I also honor the musician in you that <laughs> that you know there's something so beautiful and and the inherent uh, I, I mean for me there's something deep deep into the state of flow that one can get when you're playing music that you're like retuning yourself as you're tuning guitar and when you play yeah. music there's something so um so changing in the vibration of sound and and uh yeah man it's just an honor to be able to go on this journey together and mm. uh yeah, there's there's so much reverence to life. I feel like I've been able to witness in this journey and even going in Egypt together. It feels like it was a few months ago. It feels like it was a lifetime. It was really only like three, four weeks. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> that we were out in Egypt. That on does the, feel like a lifetime It ago. does. It really does. But yeah, like less than a month, a month ago, we were out exploring the ancient mysteries of Egypt and the Giza Plateau and the Great Pyramids on that, on that strip. And also in Saqqara and Abu Rawash and all these great sacred sites, which I feel are representations of the possibility to energetically awaken to that new timeline, you know, and um, being in the presence of something so magnificent, I feel like really allows us to awaken to that power and the capacity we have for that magnificence within us. Mm -hmm. So it was such uh, such an eye-opening time. I wish everybody can experience the wonders of the world like that and mm -hmm. how that feeling of awe can inspire you and just open you up to such a new level of perception. Mm. Um, because on the flip side of glyphosate and all these things that we're speaking to that are really diminishing our receptivity and diminishing our ability to be sensitive to the environment, there are structures, there are information, there are people, there are new, you know, things within our environment that bring us back into that coherent state like we're speaking to that yeah. open us back up into that remembrance. And so... What a ride. <laughs> what a ride. It's true. And I, you know, I'm I'm actually working this next week of taking a little bit of time off one afternoon to to try to integrate what happened in, in Egypt or a couple of the things that happened there. Um so you know, I think there's that's something that we also forget uh, in this human life that we've been programmed into is the 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 space, time and energy required for remembrance is quite uh, intense. If you are going to remember this higher order of self, you're going to have to start to prioritize the silence in your life. And for me, this has taken on very interesting, you know, qualities because so much of my life is being defined by the words that come out of my head or the words that come out on paper for the books that I'm working on or the film projects we're working on or whatever it is. And so when your life is constant communication 
as yours is, every one of you listening right now, if you are human, your life from the moment you're off the pillow to the moment you're back on the pillow, in some way you are trying to communicate with the world around you. And so the concept of silence can be like kind of overwhelming. Like, well, I can't possibly. And the excitement that I've started to be able to tap into is, my God, is there so much space between the words? And so when we start to get into that, possibility that there is an infinite space between the next thoughts or between the words that would come out of those thoughts and you just allow nature to start to 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 be seen between those moments between the words suddenly everything is pregnant there's such fertility in you when you allow an observation and awareness to start to percolate up of how much time there really is between the things that we thought were filling time, but in fact, they were holding time. And so all of the sentences I've said to you, we've proved this even in medical literature, like I can talk to a patient for 10 minutes or I can talk to them for an hour and a half. They walk away at best with 10% of what I told them. And so you will walk away with 10%. And unfortunately, that 10% is not going to be coherent. You will remember a couple words there and a couple things there. But ultimately, what you're doing over the time of this hour and a half is you are experiencing space-time memory, space-time experience. And the only thing, service that the words are providing is to keep you anchored here for long enough to experience all the information between the words. And I, I feel this and hear this from people all the time at the end of a talk that I'll give in person or whatever, I'll get off stage and 100 hu hugs waiting for me and tapping in and everybody leans into that hug and they've got their, their, their mouth in my ear and they always say, I am so mind blown. Every single thing you said, I already knew. And I love those, the combination of those two things. I'm so glad your mind is blown, meaning you have blown apart your previous beliefs and your perceptions only to find out that you already knew the truth beyond that and behind that and inside of that. And there's not, there was not one iota that I could have added to your knowledge field to make you know something new. I cannot help any of you know anything more because there is nothing more to be known. You know everything you just can't see it, feel it, remember it in the same way that you perhaps have the opportunity to. So Egypt was a good reminder to us that whole societies, whether they were human, non-human, it's irrelevant, whole societies came into right relationship with energy such that they were able to understand energy beyond the planet. And so a pyramid holding these things that we call sarcophagus or these big giant stone boxes, all of which were empty when found, nothing in them and perfectly formed inside into these sacred geometric volumes that were empty on purpose because in their emptiness, they were able to function as batteries. They were holding energy that was being channeled through the structure of the pyramids and all of this and these these vessels within the foundation systems these deep labyrinths underneath the, the pyramids were holding all of these empty vessels that would charge with energetic frequencies and for that they could produce energy for for technology they could produce energy for communication they could produce all kinds of fascinating you know resources i'm sure but the the fact that it was the emptiness inside of crystal boxes that was found to be the secret to, you know, powering a civilization to its full potential has deep message in there. And, and so when we were in that one labyrinth that had just been recently discovered and opened up, we got to see some of those empty boxes with their, their tops, you know, rip pivoted off slightly and just the, the silence that could occur when you're deep underground in these tiny little tunnels that you're crawling through because they're not tall enough to stand up in and you come to one of these boxes and the goosebumps of feeling the energy as you reach your hand inside of one of those you, you can feel like you're reaching into some other portal so through a portal into some other reality I am convinced that this is what happens inside every single human cell. Inside every human cell as a perfect temple are boxes 
of emptiness that we call atoms. There are boxes of emptiness that we call mitochondria. There is potential space within you to hold so much vibrational information in the form of energy that you could express anything in the cosmos through the genetic intelligence you have. And so we are going to re-express life on this planet. And maybe we hold on to human form, but I'm kind of agnostic to that. Why? I mean, I actually am not terribly impressed with my human form. And ultimately, I'm very grateful for it. But I mean, have you ever seen an octopus? Like eight legs, that's freaking brilliant. You know, and you can change colors at any moment. You can become, you know, camouflage incarnate. Like there is higher levels of intelligence in the nature around us at the biologic level that we don't have access to. And so maybe we should just kind of rethink our potential instead of saying, well, we need to, to just live to 180 years, which is kind of the biohacker you know, dream. I mean, if I hear one more Instagram post of I'm going to live to 180 because I figured out how to regulate my morning glucose, I <laughs> freak out. But it's like no, we, nobody wants to see your Instagram for another 180 years, first of all. Like nobody can handle that. Like. Uh, we need to let go of the longevity of the human body as the the quintessential goal of of human biology. Human biology can become something unbelievable, unseen before because we have all this unused genomics within us. We're using about one and a half percent of our genome to express our our human, current human genetics. So, what has the other ninety eight point five percent got to offer? You know, and so. I offer all of us the opportunity to start to say, as we express higher levels of light energy within us, because we start to reroute humanity in that intelligence of nature, which is literally what we do at the the science level in the in the under the microscope in our lab. We're taking sixty million year old soil. No human has ever seen sixty million year old soil because we've only been here three hundred thousand years, and that sixty million year old soil went extinct with the last extinction fifty five million years ago big asteroid hit, wiped out all the topsoils of the earth, we've been struggling back as a planet to build nutrient density back in our soil systems. Topsoils today, you know, the deepest stuff that was probably in North America before colonialism destroyed the entire ecosystem here and then the soil systems were probably six feet, eight feet deep. Back in the, you know, 55 million, 60 million years ago with the dinosaur era of, of our planet, we had topsoil levels of 25, 30, 35 feet deep. So there was a nutrient density and a potential of life and a biodiversity that was there at the microbial level that simply hasn't been mimicked again since. And so at the Intelligence of Nature, which is our, our lab and our, our soil system uh, products, we're able to expose human cells for the very first time to this deeper remembrance of the potential of life on Earth. And when we do that, the rate of protein synthesis is insane. The, the rate at which those human cells can repair has literally just never been seen before. And they can build three-dimensional structures in a freaking Petri dish. And so the, you know, even at dis, detached from a human body, they start getting information that allows them to do a regenerative phenomenon that's literally never been witnessed before. And so we've seen stem cells come out of vacuum space. We've seen all kinds of weird phenomenon happen in a Petri dish when you marry these elements of nature, structured catalytic water with these small carbon metabolites or, or snowflakes from, from carbon metabolism of bacteria and fungi in these ancient systems. That crystalline structure that becomes potential when you have living life force water with ancient memory of the potential of life, humans reimagine themselves in a petri dish. And so as you start to, to put these liquids and, and, and nutrients back into your body or, or you start to experience this for the first time, it is it gives me goosebumps every time somebody reaches for a new, you know, for the first time for a bottle of this this ancient information, because they're about to tie humanity to a new potential, a new opportunity to to re-express itself. And so, as we have been building the intelligence of nature system over the last you know, twelve years, it's been this awesome journey into reimagining what could the organic garden of human look like rooted deep into a nutrient and intelligence and a communication stream that has not been available to the species yet. 
And for that, I believe we can make these transformational changes in water structure. Uh, we can make transformational changes in ultimately the protein structures in the nucleotide se sequences that code for those. We call that DNA. And so we have the opportunity to witness in our laboratory every day the future potential of life on Earth. And, and for that, I'm forever humbled for sure. I... Uh, John Gilday, who's you know, our our senior lab director, he's a PhD in microbiology and trained at Johns Hopkins and has done an amazing you know, convoluted career into so many different spaces of genetics and beyond. But John is is one of the most heart centric humans I know, and and I've learned so much from his love for people and his care for people and his care for people connecting back to nature and back to their capacity to heal again. He's he's counseled so many people through their own health and healing journeys over the years, and I've been witness to that. And one of my favorite things about John is is for uh, big and gregarious as he is, he's got something that we call the data dance. Uh, when we get to see something in the, under the microscope that no human has ever seen before, John gets up in the lab and does this little data dance because somebody he just got to see something nobody's ever seen before. And so, over the last you know ten years of working together in our lab, we worked together actually before before our, our little biotech lab. We worked together at the university. He helped me with a lot of my cancer research. Uh, incredible microscopist, and and he actually helped me image the first mitochondrial relationships that we were describing in the beginning and everything else. But over these many years, I've gotten to see John do so many data dances and ultimately because um, on a weekly basis, we get to see miracles happen. And um, it's one of those many things that I wish I had been taught in kindergarten and ultimately in medical school, which is miracles are normal. Miracles are a reconnection to a memory of possibility before human emotion. <laughs> and so as, as we remember that life is miraculous and miracles are a nonlinear revelation of the potential of abundance within a system, we realize that there's absolutely no reason for fear, guilt, and shame there's no amount of glyphosate on the planet that can actually disrupt the truth of our biology and our capacity to reroute into nature at a deeper level to become something we've never become before. And so this is our promise as a biologic living system is that it will get more beautiful and it will get more intelligent. Every single extinction has led to that. It, the systems always get more complex always more beautiful or is more biodiverse after every single extinction and the level of intelligence and the biologic forms of, of life that come after are always more complex and, and exquisite. And as we're sitting there in, in Egypt together, as we're sitting there in Egypt together, Andre, I think one of the deep things that I felt in that group of people was that for the first time we were giving each other permission to be something never seen before. And that was one of the greatest privileges of my life was to be in an environment where there was absolutely no judgment for whatever was going to be expressed. And I think I can count on my finger maybe, maybe three times in my life where I've experienced that. And none of those three have been held at the, that level of reverence towards one another that I felt towards everybody that was in that group. And I felt from everybody in that group. And I just want to recognize you and Blue and uh, Robert Grant and everybody else who curated that group of peoples, but also curated the energy behind the gathering. You guys provided an allowance for me to be something I've never been socially visible in. You allowed me to express myself in ways I've never expressed myself in front of humans before. And I am indebted to you for that. That's a really deep gift to, to receive from another human being. So I want to recognize your, your co-creation in that with Blue and, and the others. And I also want to encourage you to continue that and continue whatever that was. The larger the vessel you can provide humanity to express itself without judgment, 
the more radical our transformation is going to be and the more accelerated that transformation will will emerge and so i am really grateful to have been seen in the way that i was in egypt by you and your colleagues and friends that i can now call my own friends and um i really needed that at my at this point in life i am more depleted as a human psyche than I've ever been. And I'm so grateful for that because it's allowing me to reach past my current version of humanness out of necessity, tapping into something unseen, un, unremembered before. And so you offered me that invitation. It came at a moment that uh, was so perfect and by the end of that trip and in conversations that I've had with a handful of the people since the trip, I think that every one of us needed that at that moment to make the jump that we were about to make but couldn't figure out how to do. <laughs> you know? And so I'm intrigued, as you said, that when we stand in awe of things achieved by past civilizations or societies, we can get a glimpse of the possibility, the potential of something much greater than we've created together so far. But that pales in comparison and glory to the experience of simply being yourself. And man, did it feel good to be myself for a few days. And I got to tune into things with abandon and I got to let those express themselves through me in weird ways that are not socially acceptable probably in most of my life and you guys not only allowed me to experience that everybody else had also invited themselves into that same opportunity and so the, the level of esoteric bizarroness that was happening in any <laughs> given room at any given moment was could not be described by any english language that i've learned <laughs> um but it, the beauty of it was so potent and the tears that were shed, the laughter that was had, the dances that were manifest, the music, my God, the voices we heard. To sit inside those temples and hear some of those women sing, my God, the voices. I, it's the closest I've ever come in this human lifetime to hearing what I would describe as angelic voices. And uh, the purity that was achieved in some of those voices. Uh, the tones that were there, and so many of the tones unjoined by words because they were just beyond, beyond human expression. They were vibrational expressions of cosmic design, sacred geometry manifest in a vocal cord. And we got to hear things that probably humans haven't heard in a very long time, if ever before. And I am confident that that changed the crystals inside of my cells. I reached a higher complexity of crystals inside my gel-like state of water because I was in the presence of a pure signal. And for that, everything in the universe changes. Uh, this bizarre reality of entanglement that quantum physics has shown us is that your thought right now changes the conformation of the most distant star in the cosmos immediately, instantaneously. We now know that in the quantum physics realm. But the times in which we can actually experience that and say we have witnessed it in the human experience are preciously few. And I feel like you gave me an opportunity to see quantum entanglement in the human experiential thing for the beauty that was channeled by the beings that were in those rooms, in those deep chambers, in those high chambers, uh, up in the pyramids. We got to witness things less seen by perhaps many entities within the universe than, than we would hope to, to know. But the preciousness of this is so far beyond. And so I am so at peace with the complete experience of being human right now for having been there, seen that, felt that, heard that. 
such that I have continued to be surprised that I keep waking up on a pillow in the morning in the same human body because it feels so complete now. And it doesn't feel good. It feels intense to feel so much. Heartbreak for humans around me. Heartbreak for my own psyche, my own frailty, my own repetitive, abusive thoughts that course through a human mind in a day. That that still can exist in me is freaking mysterious to me because the amount of energy held within my body over these decades of more and more truth revealing itself should blow apart all of that into infinitum such that it cannot exist. And so it's a frightening demonstration of the power of human belief that we are able to continue to maintain dysfunctional, reductionist, fractured belief systems that are abstract and not real in the face of such power in the face of such potency of the truth within us, within each other. I would be honored if you could take a couple minutes and just reflect on what those chambers felt like to you. I think this audience, you know, can almost feel it right now in some ways. But I would love to invite you as a brother and as another human being to just open up the space as you've been so generous to open up to me what the hell was going on <laughs> in you and in in your experience there thank you man thank you just like the you know you felt there was a non-judgmental space that was provided. Equally, you met that with the willingness to be seen, which is arguably one of the most courageous things that another human can do, really. To be seen in your full glory and your full mess, like all of it, no matter whatever your truth is. But the the willingness to be seen in that also provides a permission slip for all those that are in the space that see you, but then also that are unseen energetically. To, to be able to be seen. And I feel like we all truly want to be seen, understood. We want to be heard. And so just thank you for the permission slip that you were just by virtue of embracing this new like change in your life and this new chapter. And um, just so, so courageous, man, for everything that you're sharing with such vulnerability and the permission slip that I feel like all the listeners are, are tuning into right now. So thank you. And simultaneously while you feel low i know that you felt also extreme moments of bliss and ex expansion and ecstasy and um it's just uh what a, what a ride to have access to the full spectrum like that you know and um i feel like with that comes just more information that gets to be transmuted into your own growth growth for those that get to witness you and everything else uh the time in egypt was so eye-opening and soul expanding from being in the king's chamber with all those humans and uh, oming and making the sounds with their bodies and going in what is called a sarcophagus, but really that crystal box that you start to hit a resonant frequency in and it starts to go, won't, 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 like turns on like a vehicle almost that, you know, we've kind of lost um, understanding of the true power of the technology that is in those chambers was I think activating beyond what the English mind can even prescribe that that is but definitely felt like a cellular upgrade from my own mm -hmm. end and then also how everyone else was experiencing that time mm -hmm. uh you know i for, for me there was a great space that i feel like was provided and a deeper anchoring into like my own heart awareness that i would say um after some time in the king's chamber i went on a solo journey down to the subterranean chamber at the lowest point, a couple hundred feet underneath in the Great Pyramid. And you have about 13 billion pounds of stone and crystal above you. Energetically, you can feel the weight of that. Um, and I was just, I mean, for the faint of heart or claustrophobic, I wouldn't <laughs> recommend crawling in that small little tunnel. But once I got to the end of it, just laying down into the pit, uh, just the complete darkness of that um, feels like infinite potential simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I think that is possibly one of the greatest gifts is to afford ourselves the space to be in the silence, be in the darkness 
without any um, without acting on any urge or compulsion to do to be to 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 be anywhere other than just marinating in the space that is the void of of you know a silent moment in meditation or you know the subterranean chamber in the in the in the in the, in the great pyramid um, it felt like a deep remembering of uh, how important it is to allow ourselves to surrender into the natural seasons and cycles of life. Mm-hmm. Like we were speaking to earlier, how there is a, a needed fallow season. You know, some some need to recognize that they are in that fallow season of mm-hmm. their own internal journey, um, where things might not be blooming. And uh, but you know, inherently with that, so much is uh, being realized in the fertile soil of future growth that is to come. And so. You know, I think that we saw on that journey to Egypt a multitude of expressions of people where they are at on their own journeys, whether that is the complete breaking down of everything that they thought they knew or the complete activation of stepping into a new level of creativity that they have access to. Um, ultimately, what was you know, powerful outside of my own experience was being just witness to the power of human connection. Mm-hmm. And... I think that's where the magic is. I know that's where the magic is mm-hmm. because I feel that every single time when people come together in radical presence with vulnerability and the capacity to listen truly, to actually be with another person and not listening with the mind, but with our own presence, with our own being, we get to experience and be witness to what needs to be heard. And with that, I feel like comes the possibility for that change and the exponential growth. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, thank you for the invitation opening to, mm-hmm. to share a little bit more about this. Ultimately, it felt like uh, a deeper claiming and owning on a somatic level of what we're here to do in this time mm-hmm. um, and what I'm here to do in this time and who I'm here to be a stand for. And that is much of a privilege as a burden, you know, as it is a burden because... I think our purpose is uh, once we realize and feel that like w- what is most pulling on our heart to do in this life, it becomes, uh, like I said, a great privilege to know that, but also something that is so painful to not act on that you must act, you know? And so for for me, part of that is facilitating more in a larger containers and bigger vessels for these human, these human connections to happen and to be a bridge for that space. And to to keep on doing what I'm doing here and and doing it with more reverence and more capacity to listen and be changed to what I hear. Um, and that is something that I love that I believe Mark Nepo, a quote of his was, to listen is to lean in gently with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. Hmm. Wow. I love that. I love that, and I I really resonate with the concept of that weight or that burden esque quality to seeing the larger version of yourself or the larger purpose of why you think you're here. All that I mean, that's once felt. Everything else you've previously felt seems like it was you know, irrelevant or so minuscule that it doesn't even matter, right? Um, And I think that what has, you know, I I have one advantage over you in life only, which is I'm old. (laughs) (laughs) And so the decades that separate us in life have made the burden lighter. And it's, and I think, you know, I may be exactly in the same place as you. I don't feel like I'm ahead of you and knowing my purpose or knowing the, 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 scale of that or whatever it is but i am intrigued by the lightning of it um and i think that's what's happening over these especially the last 10 years of my life realizing that just because i can see the whole doesn't mean that i'm going to achieve it by the same principles by which i got here now and so the the freedom to imagine or the freedom to surrender and understanding of how you achieve that massive version of yourself uh, has to be part of the equation. 
because if we allow the burden part to be there, then it does weigh down the psyche. It weighs down our vibrational frequencies. It adds static to the DNA, so we can't express the thing. And then we get more and more frustrated because it's like, well, another decade's gone by, and I still haven't reached my purpose. I'm not still <laughs> achieving it. And what I'm finding out, you know, more and more in my own personal life is like, oh my gosh, that that big potential, that big purpose, that big thing actually already happened. It already exists. Therefore, it can be seen. My little three-dimensional perception here of a human mind finally can see it, not because it's in some distant future that hasn't arrived, but because it's already been achieved. And from my perspective, it looks like it's it, it, it's separate from now, but it's only because I can't see the real now that it looks separate from now. Your full purpose already happened. It's already here. It's fully expressed. And so the, the invitation, I think, for all of us is once glimpsed that full weight and full gravitational capacity of the full expression of self is something to be surrendered into rather than achieved. It is something to be received rather than obtained. And I am recognizing that the most challenging place, and this may be just for me personally, but I look across humanity and I think it's a relatively common scenario that where we struggle the most with this manifestation of our full expression of self, purpose, blah, 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 is as we is in all of the constructs that we have put together that approach the thing that we call love. <laughs> and so the nearer you are to the topic of love and the constructs that you've put around that topic might be, uh, I have a mother and I expect this and I am a mother and I expect this of my kids or I am a blank, I am a doctor, I am a boss, I am an employee, I am a teacher, I am a student, I am a all these roles that we take on, the closer that those roles are bringing us to the purpose of love, the more likely they are to, to be screwed up. <laughs> and the more likely they are to be perceived as super complicated and full of duty and responsibility and weight and everything else because we fail to believe that we are already loved to the fullest potential. <laughs> and this is really my deepest wound as a human being. As I run around feeling unseen, misjudged, overjudged, you know, misunderstood in my effort to love other people. And therefore I feel unloved. When in fact it's the biggest fallacy in the universe that anything can get in the way of love or that love needs anything. It's absolutely physically, absolutely property impossible that love needs anything or love expresses something to get, you know, gift something to somebody that they didn't have a moment before. Love is a frequency condition of biology being seen by other biology. <laughs> The difference between physics and biology is physics cannot see anything else around it. It cannot experience other features around it in a way that it wasn't already experiencing it because it already is connected to everything. That's why we call it quantum physics, not quantum biology, because quantum physics is everything at the same time. Out of quantum physics becomes this ethereal reality of biology, of life. Life is a finite expression of an infinite reality of physics. To achieve itself, it has to burn 10,000 times brighter than the physics. And in that brightness, it inherently is going to go out at some point. And so the ethereal, temporal, finite nature of being alive is the purpose of being in human body right now. And for that, you are going to be an infinite being in a finite moment so that you can see the beauty. When you are the star or you are out in space, I don't believe there is a perceptional difference. And I get to see and hear about this all the time in near-death experiences. So we let go of the body, and they suddenly you know, merge with the star. They go out in the universe. They're connected to everything. Complete acceptance is experienced at the cellular atomic level, and they are quantum physics itself, and they know the divine. They know God. Whatever it was that they were confused about in the human mind is now gone, and they get the whole beauty of it. They get the whole incredible 
you know, spectacular experience of being everything, the unified field, the, the unity. I am. And then they suddenly get shocked back into the body and paddles on their chest and drugs pumping into their vein and they're in the ICU and I just brought them back into the body. And they can tell me this whole freaking journey into oneness and all this, but they didn't see things in the same way that they do as soon as they're back in a physical body and have eyes and say, oh, there's the sunset and there's the thing. And the, so the phenomenon of taking the infinite reality of being into being alive in a finite reality is the gift of sight, ultimately. We can perceive the beauty of the physical universe for being biologically finite, being biologically separated from oneness for that moment so that we can see all the beauty. When we see beauty, perhaps really unique to the human biology because of the uniqueness of our five senses and believing we're separate from everything and having an ego that then separates us emotionally, energetically, philosophically from all things. For that, we might be even better at seeing the beauty because we have more separation than any other species, perhaps. And for this, we stare at the sunset. The birds don't stop to look at the sunset. I'm always amazed by that. Monkeys in the trees in Africa, when I'm staring at that sunset, backs to it, they're cracking nuts. They seem to be completely oblivious and have no care for the fact that the sky is doing freaking spectacular things behind them. Because the monkey can probably feel that. It doesn't have to stop and observe it and wonder at it and all that. It's just like, yeah, of course, sunset beauty. I'm beauty. I'm the thing. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the monkey. I'm beauty. <laughs> sunset, blah, blah, blah. No big deal. As human, because I believe myself to be separate from everything, to be at this pinnacle of biology, which is to say a pinnacle of finite existence, finite beliefs, finite everything, I can see the infinite so well. And for that, I am a wonderment to the entire universe because I get the experience of vibrating with this frequency that we have come in the English language to dumb down to the word love. But there is a frequency, which is a wide bandwidth of experience, a wide bandwidth of feeling that is not like, oh, I'm in love. The frequency of love encompasses every emotion that humans have ever described. It, it encompasses every feeling a human body is capable of vibrating in. Is a massive carrier wave of information that happens when we witness beauty. And so um, I'm really grateful for being in a finite body. I'm constantly tortured and tormented by the psychology of a mind believing itself to be separate from everything. But the gift is that I can see the beauty of everything and I can feel everything, including the pain. Lynn Twist is on my board for my nonprofit project, Biome. She's one of the brightest minds of the 20th century, I think, and, uh, and fortunately brings that into the 21st century with us now. And she's bringing this intelligence and vibration into the world through so many of her books and brilliance there. But she said something amazing in our board meeting yesterday. She said the pain is what pushes us forward until vision can pull us forward. Pain is what pushes us forward until vision can pull us forward. And I think she was quoting somebody on that, but forever in my mind that will be a Lynn Twist quote. <laughs> so Lynn, I'm attributing that to you now. Um, but for me that shifted something inside of me hearing that again is that we need to celebrate the hell out of the pain that we feel when we can see the purpose that hasn't apparently become yet. That pain is what pushes us forward until we have the vision that it's already received, that it's already here, that we already have obtained whatever it is that we are here to express in the universe. It's already here. We just need to perceive it and the vision will come and the pain will decrease of the burden that you feel for having glimpsed your real full purpose there in Egypt or, or, um, or wherever it comes from there. So my encouragement to you is celebrate the pain. It will push you into the vision of realizing you already arrived. And um, I'm, I'm just so intrigued by you, Andre. You are, have so much ahead of you and your, your runway is so broad. I can't even fathom having a conversation with you right now, what it would have been like to live my life having been capable of this conversation when I was your age. It's so fucking exciting. <laughs> it's so exciting, brother. You, you are on a very accelerated path of, of 
self-revelation, and it's just going to be a joy to witness your your self-expression on this planet that will be social, professional, all kinds of things will come out of that. But my goodness, you're on a wonderful path, and uh, it's an honor to hang out and be witness to it intermittently here because it's going to be awesome. So mm. uh, every single path is awesome, and I just uh, hero uh, uh, amazement to all of you listening here. My gosh, y'all are spectacular. My goodness, you are a miracle. My goodness, did you show up right at the right moment for human history. Honored to be with each of you. Honored to be feeling you present in this room with us. Honored to be having a human moment for the finite that allows for the pain, that allows for our capacity to see the beauty so that we vibrate in love. Zach, thank you so much. Without, I mean, my path, my runway doesn't become possible without getting to have the joy of reflection from individuals like yourself and what that gets to awaken and sprout in myself um, via that reflection and um, just a joy to be on this journey together, you know? So thank you for seeing me and reflecting all that beauty that you see in me and just reflected back tenfold the permission that you give to others and um, you know, I just, I really feel like you're it was such an incredible synthesizer of understanding where we're currently at, where we've gone wrong and our capacity to make that shift. Like I said, in the beginning, uh, that reminder that you give to us at this time is so potent. It's right on time. It's very much so needed. And another Lynn twist quote, I think I mentioned last time on the podcast was, uh, there's nothing more powerful than an idea that's time has come. And I think we're speaking to an idea that's time has come. I was really moved by a story that you shared when you were 19, when you became an unexpected doula to give birth to a <laughs> life in the Philippines in the back of a van. Um, and the amount of reverence that must have, you know, birthed in you for life. And I know that as you've been present to so much for the birth and death process within, within the human journey, I can only imagine what that's opened up for you in your own capacity for reverence of life. And I feel like what we're speaking to in this conversation is really the ultimately the reminder um, to realize how precious we are and to afford ourselves the love and the space for non-judgment that we often don't give ourselves and to release that shame and guilt and judgment. And um, in closing, I, I would love for you to actually share a little bit about that 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 moment and what mm. that opened in you. Hmm. Mm, that's cool. That's an unexpected end point for this conversation. <laughs> and I'm honoring that being that we'll talk about here for being so potent that we, we would conclude such a micro to macro vast conversation. And this, this little infant is appropriate. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, uh, you know, Ended up in the Philippines by just only the way that the highest you know, version of self or the divine can can write because I was didn't intend to go into medicine in my life at all. I, I was heading towards engineering. I was a very <clears throat> unhappy student in my uh, first 18 years of primary school and uh, public education in the United States. I, I didn't like school at all as far as... You know, it just, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, I guess, in some ways, but it certainly didn't spur any curiosity. And so I I found myself spending almost all my curious time and creative time outside of school. And I was really blessed with an incredible group of friends that we went through scouting and, uh, you know, all aspects of our lives together between kind of age 11 to today. And those are still some of my best friends in the, in the world. And this little core group of five or five or six of us, um, you know, we're building cars and building houses and building anything we could think of on a day. We, we were trying to, I remember one point we were trying to create a, a, a photon gun, like, <laughs> like stupid stuff, you know, like, and 99% of the stuff we ever set out to build never worked or we never completed or whatever it was. But it was an incredible gift to be invited into a place where I was constantly able to just like imagine what we could build next. And so in that experience where my own, my only creative outlets were outside of school, I just didn't think I was a good student. And I, I say all of that because there's so many of you that are brilliant minds that are ready to be stimulated to places you can't imagine when you lose the narrative that you're not a good student or you're not good at school or you're not good at learning or you're not smart 
all of those things. At any age, you can step into an experience of knowledge that will blow you away. You will know so much so fast when you open up a new narrative that you already know everything, that you are a creative force of the divine. And I didn't get to feel that, see that until I was in medical school. And so I had... I had to go through a bunch of you know revelations, I guess, in, in one way of saying it, to get to that point where I thought that I was a good enough student to deserve to go to medical school or something. And this experience in the Philippines was a potent moment for that uh, with this infant. Um, my I had decided to take a year off from college because I you know was going into an engineering program and then had my heart broken by my first girlfriend and just as only as dramatic as an 18 year old boy can be I said my gosh to heal this wounded heart of mine I need a year off I need to go find myself like as if I was going to find myself at 19 years old there's no way but but I was super dramatic and, and 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 if there's one trait I have I am so freaking earnest about everything I do. So, so earnest, I went out to go find myself in the world and take this year off. And within seconds, literally, I mean, not even an hour had passed for me deciding to take that year off. And the phone rings. Um, it was a Sunday. I, I wasn't living with my parents at the time, but I was had gone to church that morning and, and was hanging out for lunch at their place. Their phone rings. I happened to answer their phone. Uh, we used to have landlines at that time, and, and it was this phone, and and it was my aunt from the Philippines, and she was like, "Hey, what are you up to?" I was like, "Oh, I just, you know, super earnest moment. I just decided to take a year off and dedicate myself to blah blah blah." And she's like, "Well, why don't you come to the Philippines and birth babies?" And I was like, "That's a very good idea. Okay, I'll do that." You know, I was like, no thought went into it at all. Like it was just like one of those things where universe sees that opening, that little space of, okay, I'm not going to do the thing that I thought I was going to do. I'm going to take a pause. Universe immediately right there, like, let me show you something bigger. Let me show you something greater. Let me show you something that you can't even imagine. And so I just knew, I suppose at a deep level, okay, that's the path I'm supposed to take. So with no really questions asked or whatever, I start, I went and got a job at discount tire company and busted tires for six months because I'd asked her, you know, how much money do I need to get there and live for six months or whatever I need to do. And so I went and ra- I earned you know, five grand or six grand or something like that and uh, busting tires. And I was working overtime every chance I got to, to get the money in the bank, to get the flight over and to live in the Philippines for six months. And what I hadn't thought through is that she had said that I'd be working with an international group of midwives didn't actually I had never heard that word before, so I didn't really process what that was going to mean for me. But show up over there, and of course, that means you're birthing babies pretty quickly. And of course, I had absolutely no medical training, no knowledge of what I was doing. But she had assured me that they would just teach me what I needed on you know, once I arrived. So at arrival, I started learning how to do these 14-day checkups for these infants, and I was the assistant to another midwife and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly two weeks in, this midwife gets called back to a family emergency in Canada, so she's flying off, and everybody's like, all right, now you just do it. And I was like, I, I've been like through two clinics. I've been like learning two, two weeks. Like I have nothing. I was so insecure, so frightened by the whole thing. And they're like, no, no, you got it. The hip dystocia and the heart murmurs, and you're just screening for, you know, blah, blah. So I started doing these little newborn screenings and, you know, every Thursday you would have 40 or 50 women line up with their newborn babies. And in the Philippines, the nutrient you know, level is so low that these kids are tiny. And so you've got these three pound, four pound babies being handed to you and you're a 19 year old kid with no medical training. You can fit one of these babies in a single hand, you know, you put them on scale, you do your thing, you check their hips for... You mean joint dysfunction, you check their spine for incomplete spine formation, you do a few little simple reflexes and you look at the nose, ears, listen for the heart murmur, blah, blah, blah. It was so magical to be at this interface of a mother with a child that just came out of its womb, to be witness to that, to be called into a place where that mother would have any sort of trust in you as a being or as a person to, and they would be so grateful for whatever witnessing you're giving to their child and reassurance that the child is healthy. And it was in this setting that a month or two in, uh, middle of the night, doorbell rings, and this woman is hemorrhaging, bleeding out on the doorstep. We had never seen her before. 
it was a really, really, really tragic thing to witness. She was probably in her mid thirties and, um, was born with, you know, a, a big brain injury. And so was nonverbal, you know, very delayed mentally and, uh, probably had no concept that she was pregnant. She'd been raped and become pregnant. And she's bleeding out on the doorstep with um, what appears probably to be an incomplete pregnancy just because she doesn't look very pregnant. Um, and so we put her in the van really quickly. And uh, my aunt, I, I didn't know Manila well enough in the Philippines to drive at that moment to the hospital, which was about an hour drive, 45 minute drive. So my aunt jumps in the front and and uh, I'm in the back seat with this woman hemorrhaging and got her thrown on towels and trying to, to kind of soak up the blood and staunch the situation. And we're rushing through the dark in the middle of the night. It's about 2 o'clock in the morning or something. And suddenly this woman spontaneously gives birth to this this infant in my hands. And it goes from like, oh, my gosh, she's hemorrhaging to, oh, my gosh, there is a, a living being in my hand, you know. And... It also happened so fast, and and to this day, I haven't actually experienced the same thing since because I didn't have any clubs on. I didn't have any protection or anything else that I forever after would would have on me in the hospital settings when I was doing this kind of stuff. But to have suddenly the experience of a a, a living life form in your hand, and uh, or this perfect infant, um, and it was it was actually not not apparently alive. It was blue. It hadn't taken a breath and tiny. I mean, it, I had gotten a little bit used to three or four pound babies, but this thing was just, it, it was more like the size that you would expect, you know, a mouse or something. It was so small, toes down at the palm of my hand and, and head at, at the, the tip of my finger. And uh, it was absolutely perfect. And it's dark and we're whipping through streets at this point where you've got like the the lamp light, you know, the street lights intermittent. And so in this weird, like almost like cartoon-esque animation, you're getting these flashes of light every second or so of a, another street lamp. And this thing is, you know, animating or not animating in front of you uh, with this light. And what was so overwhelming to me was the perfection of the body. You know, this thing is not big enough to fill my hand. And yet, the features of that face are so exquisitely perfect. The fingers are so perfect, and yet they're almost invisible for how tiny they are. I mean, we're talking about fingers that are, you know, half a half a centimeter long, you know, and yet they are just perfection. And each of those tiny fingers has a fingernail on it. Like it's, it just was defying all logic to me how perfect this thing is in my hand at that moment. And I'm trying, I'm sure I'm taking that in very quickly, but at the time, or when I think back on it, I felt like an eon was being experienced and just being witnessed the beauty of the perfection design of this, this human body in my hand. And, you know, I'm yell, yelling to my aunt I, she just gave birth to this thing it's not moving it's not breathing and my aunt's just reassuring me it's like okay it's okay it just you know it's it's okay it just didn't have the chance to live you know she's trying to reassure me that this thing is you know I, like there's no expectation that you're going to bring this thing to life or whatever <laughs> she's reassuring me the woman's still bleeding I don't know how the heck to handle that situation <laughs> and so I'm in this intense moment of just all beauty and terror all combined at once and then that little infant suddenly gave out a cry and it was like the tiniest noise that a being can probably make but in my auditory experience of it it was like the loudest scream I'd ever heard in my life like it just like all attention now was like on this thing and then I was like I think it's alive and my aunt I'm sure is like pretty dubious at this point but Fortunately, we're only at that point a few minutes from the hospital. We end up pulling into the emergency you know, area in this hospital in the middle of the night. It's understaffed. So nobody, nobody even comes running out initially. And so my aunt goes running in, and I've got bloody towels all around me. I mean, it's just a scene of total chaos, and, and I'm just so 
inept and unprepared to be of any help to anything, especially this thing in my hand at that moment. But the thing is starting to pink up, like it's breathing and it's doing its thing. And staff ends up coming out. We end up, you know, being able to pass the woman and the baby on. Uh, both end up surviving uh, for the weekend at least. And the woman ends up, I think, surviving for the long term as far as I know. But the infant ends up dying a couple days later. And I often wonder at, you know, that one little scream, you know, that happened because it's, it may have been the only noise that thing ever made. I never heard it make another noise than that initial breath and that initial vocalization of that scream. And that thing was like looking up into my face for a period of time and and you I, I wonder what the experience of that soul was. It shows a finite moment. It's an infinite being that wanted so dearly to see beauty. And I'm overwhelmed with the, <laughs> the understanding that might have been my face and that's about all it experienced because the next moment it was put into some sort of incubator and maybe I've ne never gotten to see human face directly again, probably never saw its own mother's face, which is a tragedy. And so there's something that happened in me, I'm sure, at that time that is embodied in me, that is alive in me because that thing was able to come into a finite moment and be alive just for a few breaths to maybe just say the one scream. And that was enough for that being... And it, it fulfilled whatever it needed to. And I often wonder, uh, you know, what did it see before me? What, what kind of beauty did it see in the womb? What did the sunrise, sunset look like in its own mother's womb? Because light does travel through the, the abdomen and into the, into the womb, especially later in pregnancy. And so what beauty did it come to feel, to see, to ha take? And what was the one thing it communicated in the scream and I hope that my career has also been a tribute to that voice I hope that ultimately what's been you know manifest out of all of the years of study and effort and service and hospitals and everything else I hope that all of that is emblematic of the power that was in that voice, that was in that one expression of a finite being wanting to be heard, wanting to be seen for a moment, wanting to see for a moment. And uh, it had the entire human experience in that moment. It, it, it achieved everything that it had come to achieve, and it let go of the body quickly. All of that, I guess, is ultimately something to be said for. I hope that you hear the humans screaming around you today. I hope you can all hear the pain and the beauty in every scream and every fear that's vocalized and every ecstasy that's expressed around you. Wonder at it. Wonder at the fact that you are given the physical capacity as a living being to be witness to a voice. And of all the voices that are probably most important to hear, it's your own. And I hope that you all take a moment today just to be in awe that you are a breathing child of the divine, picking this finite moment to express yourself. Give reverence to your own voice, to the scream inside of you that suffers in the pain of the disconnect between the glory that you know you are, the glory that you know the humans around you have that, that you love, and the discordance of their behavior, the discordance of our capacity to understand the love we have for one another. I honor your pain. I honor your heartbreak. I honor the scream that is emanating through you right now. You are the infant in my hand. I am the infant in yours. And uh, together we, we have the opportunity to birth a new humanity, a new biology, a new expression of self. And so may we honor all of the aborted potential 
of humanity within ourselves and within those that we see around ourselves so that we can become the thing that we know is possible. <laughs> Thank you, bro. <sighs> Thank you for all the potent reminders from the pain to the beauty, man. Everything that you shared in that story is just uh, awakening us to the reverence that we get to have for this finite experience in this body. And um, I'm infinitely grateful for how the divine is expressing it through in this child of Zach, because <laughs> it's such a joy to witness. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing yourself today. Um, any final words before we close out? Mm. Just an invitation to connect, you know. Um, yeah. I'm I'm ready to be filled up by connection to all of you listening. Uh, you can go to intelligenceofnature.com and join our community there. Um, it's all of the science that you've heard today is is on that website, intelligenceofnature.com. I'm curious to see what happens inside of you when you root into that intelligence, that capacity that nature has to express your new humanity. Uh, so dive into that uh, science and and the resources that are there, the the products that are there are, are fascinating to me, fascinating to the scientists, but they don't actually become real until they're they're put into your body, into your finite moment. Uh, so get curious, end up there at intelligenceinnature.com. Um, join me uh, for the Global Health Education Summits. Uh, those are easily accessed on zachbushmd.com on the knowledge page. Um, there's a lot of deep dives on science. I go into things like the virome and what are actually viruses and what are genes and what is genetic modification and what is the GMO world of food and all those things are all featured in a bunch of different lectures. And we also have a bunch of... Uh, uh, professional, you know, expert panels that are brought to you on the Global Health Education Summit on a whole series of topics out there. Some of our most you know, popular and important ones included our, our coverage of mental health and, and depression uh, revelations there for you to really kind of change your your relationship to that body of information or those t those titles or diagnoses. Uh, we have one coming up uh, here in January of, of 2024. I'm very excited about it. We're, it's a revelation on metabolism and diabetes specifically and how we need to rethink our relationship to that diagnosis and to the food system at large and all that. So a uh, panel of experts joining me there to talk through for a couple hours on new perspectives on diabetes that are coming out of not just our lab, but, but broadly speaking as we start to rethink this. Um, so lots of education free on, on my website there, Zach Bush MD. The whole global health education series is all free. It's been funded entirely through donations. So you can also support the Global Health Education Summit with donations there. But, but uh, that's a, a fun place to engage. Um, if you're ready for your new journey, if you're really ready to, to root into you know, an opportunity to be seen by a group of people and be self-expressed in a new community. Our journey of intrinsic health is our eight-week program and it has now become an entire environment and ecosystem. Um, we have a, a evergreen membership program now and so once you've gone through the course and now even actually before you go through the course you can join the, uh, the membership group and, and in that space um, we have weekly meetings, we have weekly think tanks, we have um, monthly, you know, collaborations and, and mindsets that I run uh, with that group and all that. But the eight-week program is blessed with the coaching uh, series. And so uh, when you go through the eight-week program, we, we do a deep dive of, of reconnecting you to relationship with your food, new relationship with breath, new relationship with movement, the concept of rest, the concept of play, the concept of being, the concept of connecting to community. All of those kind of eight tiers of, of being a finite being expressing an infinite reality are, are you know workshopped in this eight week program, and each group is you know, coached by an individual that is holding space for six or eight people to experience one another's transformation. We also have a one on one if if you're going through a particularly you know, personal health journey or something like that where you need the the privacy or the, the extra time on the one on one coaching. There's that as well. But that coach holding that space to be witnessed in that and then community coming around you to watch your growth and transformation has become one of the most potent things that I've ever been a part of. So potent that we've actually closed my clinic now, recognizing that this program was much more potent in its transformation capacity than my clinic ever was. So 
it's been a joy to watch humans heal humans rather than humans become dependent on on doctors and uh, to let go of my doctoring to become a fellow human and healing transformation has been a real joy. So journeyofintrinsichealth.com can get you there. You can find it via my website as well, Zach Bush MD. So just an invitation to all of us. We, we need to connect. I need your connection. I can't keep going without all of you being part of that revolution. So you know, really, really eager to connect with you. And uh, it will be a beautiful thing for me to witness to you joining that. So many incredible resources and ways to continue the activation and rem remembrance and um, so empowering. Like a lot of those insights and understandings, I think that you're working through with intelligence of change and, and all those. Um, we'll leave links for everything down in the description. Everybody, thanks for tuning into this episode. It's been a couple months since we were in the studio recording. It feels so good to be back here in the new year, um, christening it back in with Zach. And uh, for everybody that has been moved by this podcast, please let us know how so in the comment section. And we love hearing from you. Thank you for being a part of this global change. And until next time, be well.